can you think back to a time that your face gave you access to your banking app? Have you translated a restaurant menu by taking a photo of it? Is your inbox delightfully clear of spam? Are your digital photos automatically tagged with correct friends and family? Do you bark at your Apple Watch or Amazon Echo to set a timer? Are you intrigued or bitterly disappointed every night when you're trying to get look for your Netflix film recommendations? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you are already interacting with artificial intelligence. So officially, this is not going to be difficult. I'm Tabitha Goldstorb, and I'm here to talk to you about why AI matters and what you can do to make sure it works for you, not you, it. The best way I can explain AI to all of you is unfold a map in your mind. Take an old fashioned static A to Z. The first Google Maps was also static. If you wanted to get from A to B, you'd plug in your postcode and be guided with no additional intelligence, just left and right following the roads, whatever was in front of you. Once AI was added to Google Maps, millions of images, real time traffic data was inputted and could, you could get now from A to B with the least amount of traffic. The systems learned from this data, rather than needing instructions every time there was a left or a right turn, it would seemingly decide for itself. Now, and also you and your compadres could disagree whether or not Google Maps was going to be faster than you were. But now things like Google Calendar can record your dentist appointments, automatically personalize your maps, include where your dentist is, and suggest times so you can leave on time. I'm don't mind if you still disagree with your Google, but you know it's going to get you there faster. Because AI is automating everyday tasks at an unprecedented pace. The global AI market is expected to reach a revenue of $118 billion by 2025. McKinsey reported that AI could deliver a 10% increase to UK GDP by 2030. IEEE predicts that by 2040, 75% of your vehicles will be autonomous and self-driving. Therefore, in less than 20 years, it's likely that most of you listening will have become already comfortable in relying on AI to get you from A to B. We're now living in an era where machines are taught to learn and adapt without human intervention. And this unlocks incredible and endless opportunity to make the world a better place. But the risks associated with this innovation are also unending. Because the reality of AI is that it adopts the truths of its creators humans. AI driven machines learn from the data that humans feed into their systems. So if this data and the power dynamics around this new superpower aren't managed carefully, the technology could widen the poverty gap, further increase inequality, reduce diversity and re entrench many of the structures that keep people down no matter what they do. Anyone who tells you otherwise is not telling you the whole story. And I'm an entrepreneur on a mission to prevent this happening and encourage more responsible innovation to unlock all the rewards of AI and reduce the risks. I'm working within the ecosystem to fight for a brighter AI enabled future. And I do this in three ways. Firstly, at COGX, as Ollie said, each year we hold a festival in London where over 20,000 visitors from industry, government and civil society and academia come together to discuss how we get the next 10 years right. I would love it if you'd like to join us this June, where we hope to be physically together as safely and legally as possible, as well as meeting virtually at the same time. Last June, we have over 40,000 people logging in online and you can join us to learn and do business. Secondly, as the chair of the AI Council, which was formed by the Secretary of State for DCMS and Bayes in 2018 as an independent expert committee to advise the government. The council itself is made up of 22 of the UK's leading thinkers, from the COO of DeepMind to the hottest startup founders and brightest university professors. Most recently, we published a roadmap urging the government to announce a new national AI strategy, which luckily a month later, they've agreed to do. And we're assisting them in the creation of it, ready at the end of this year. Lastly, how to talk to robots. A media company I founded recently, looking at ways to engage the general public in AI and bring more people on this journey. Last summer, HarperCollins published my book, A Girl's Guide to a World Dominated by AI. In the book, I make some recommendations for the reader, and I've adapted two of them. For those who are listening, I hope I have adapted them right. The first piece of advice is embrace change and help others to do the same. Because in the future, there is a reality where you'll have your own personal AI, and you'll have a job that can't be done by computers because they lack common sense, nor by unaided humans who only have so much time and memory. 
It's about an AI human collaboration. So you're going to need to get your muscle memory ready to work in collaboration with an AI. I think you'll like AI expert Peter Domingo's description of this future. He explains that AI is a horse for your mind and horses don't compete with their riders. They let them go further and faster. And we're already seeing this happening today because the magic of AI is that it can increase your profits, reduce your costs and improve experiences for staff and customers, which is an unusual trifecta to get right. That's why 70% of all financial services are already using AI to assist with things like trades, project cash flow events, fine tune credit scores and detect fraud. So it's already going to affect you, your partners, your clients, colleagues and staff to go further and faster. I'm working to encourage the ecosystem to design processes around the strengths and fragilities of humans with ways for them to voice their problems, propose solutions and claim a share of the productivity gains. And you can do the same by embracing change and catalyzing a conversation about how your own business can be augmented with AI. Start small. Think about the problems you wish you could solve. What historical or real-time data do you have? What questions do you wish it could answer? This is a really good way to dip your toe in and something you can do straight away. If you aren't already doing it, or, uh, doing it there are hundreds of companies out there that can help. The second piece of advice is to invest in the AI that you want to see in the world. To me, investing in AI means pointing tech, tools, talent, and funds at the most pressing challenges of the day that alone humans haven't been able to address, which is why I'm most excited about where AI can help in fighting the health crisis and the climate crisis. As you all know, we have until 2030 to prevent the planet warming by an additional 1.3 degrees. This is a huge political, cultural, business, and I believe technical challenge. AI-powered technologies can and already are playing a role in the fight against climate change. Researchers are using AI to create models and projections about the state of the environment to impact policy and to direct activity. For example, using AI to map areas which might be prone to flooding, which I imagine you've all experienced this year alone. AI is also part of the toolbox for reducing carbon emissions by both creating new alternative and managing energy demand. Companies are beginning to use AI technologies for image classification to sort out food and rubbish waste. My partner is a regen wheat farmer and starting to use AI in health checks to detect de disease in crops far earlier than the human eye. And as we just saw from Shafi, this is not just about the health of our planet, it's about the health of us as humans too. From medical imaging to genetics and drug discovery, robotic assisted surgery to virtual doctors, improvements in the administrative process, simulating clinical trials and diagnostic devices. The sector is really booming. Advances range from risk prediction to new discoveries and causes, signs, cures, and manifestations of diseases. This is because instead of learning how to classify new cases of a disease like cancer based on predefined rules, the systems learn from the examples provided and detect patterns and features that predict the output just as I described in your maps. This enables the AI technology to identify anomalies that humans do not. Algorithms trained in this way can outperform humans in some classifications. And therefore, there are a handful of very promising companies like UK Kiron Med creating products to increase doctors' detection of cancers. I hope all of this gives you a feel for the impact that AI will have and its potential to dramatically accelerate progress in some of the most fundamental fields and ensure that you're conscious of the risks because only if AI is deployed responsibly, ethically and for everyone will we be able to unlock a future where we all live longer, healthier, happier lives. Hopefully we get some questions from everybody. Thank you. As predicted, you have <laughs> sparked my imagination. I'm sure uh, that of the group. I've got questions uh, coming in already. Tabitha, I love that analogy about um, AI uh, being the horse, if you like, for the mind. So I guess my first question is, who is going to teach us to ride? Very good question. So in the um, roadmap that the AI Council wrote for the government, we suggest an, a, a, an academy for artificial intelligence. And really, we there are two challenges here. There are lots of amazing companies out there that, would, that will teach people to, to ride or to use AI at an executive level. 
but we believed as a council that actually the government needs to also um, be a part of this because otherwise only the very, very um, affluent will be able to learn. And if this is to work, as I said, we need everybody to, to learn. Second challenge is how do we get everybody to want to learn? Yeah. People are busy. People are tired. People are fed up of needing to retrain, retrain and reskill all the time. And that's where the media company that I've set up, How to Talk to Robots, comes in, where I'm trying to put out into the world more fun, exciting ways that don't feel like learning to get involved in AI. So I have a new TV show, uh, which I haven't told you about yet, but I really want to, um, where you get the Great British Bake Off meets a science fair. And we put on you know, national television at 6 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon where people sit together and we show the potential that this AI has and hopefully inspire people to want to learn and to, to teach themselves. Excellent. Good. Well, watch I out, Mary. Like watch out, Mary Berry. Uh, Tabitha is on her way. And, and, and what about if we take that one step further down into schools? Uh, well, what age is the right age to start, I guess, teaching, if you like, educating the next generation about all of this? So we... Good, very good point. I started just thinking about, um, you know, lifelong learning, didn't I? Schools are the, the most important place to start. However, schools are also overstretched. And ultimately, there are there are changes to the curriculum that are happening. But really, the risk that we have with schools is that kids are being taught to code. And coding is useful. But a lot of coding will be done by, if not all, by artificial intelligent machines because it's a very instructional rather than human um, type of engineering. And so what we really need in schools is the softer, or what is described as softer skills, but I think of the, you know, ace skills, the problem solving, the critical thinking, the team working, the, 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 the using of technology in your own subjects, yeah. project-based learning. And ultimately, this can start from day zero. You know, nursery school, um, we should be thinking uh, and helping young people to see themselves in relation to each other yeah. um, and in relation to machines as well, because ultimately, that's how we're going to be using, um, using technology to support us, like the horse of the mind. Um, Conrad Wolfram is one of my favorite authors on this. He wrote The Maths fix, yeah. which is about helping people do incredibly, um, it, it learn maths in an incredibly different way, where it's not just by rote, it's actually about understanding the basis of maths, which, um, which is also the basis of artificial intelligence. Yeah. So there's some out of the box thinking here that I think is needed. Love it. So if you've got a question for Tabitha, please do fire it in now. We'll try and get through a few. Um, next I've question. I've got one. Oh, Roger, good. Hi, Tabitha. Um, I suppose just picking up on your point about um, using it responsibly, do you think that we're still a little frightened of the robots? And is that um, a break on us really, really grabbing and grasping all the opportunities of AI? I think we are a little frightened. Um, you know, Hollywood doesn't help with its, you know, killer robot, eye robot um, movies, but also neither does um, the UK press. Um, and to be fair, neither does do, do some politicians who describe mutant algorithms. So there's a definitely a narrative that needs to be changed. And ultimately, we should be fearful. Like, I don't want to say we shouldn't be fearful because we should scrutinize and make sure that we are comfortable with this kind of technology. But fear isn't useful because it doesn't push us forward. So I think we need to uh, think about scrutinizing and be sure we're comfortable before we go and uh, interact with the technologies. I don't think people, I, I think we should be sort of proud of that, that fear and try slowly to, to get rid of it. I definitely don't want anybody to suddenly think, okay, you shouldn't be fearful. Okay. Um, because ultimately there's a long journey to go and there's a lot of regulation that's going to be needed and regulation scares people as well. Um, but we've definitely seen a turn, a turn in the tide around the understanding of the need for regulation. The European Union just re re released a, um, a recommendation on how they will regulate AI. In the Queen's speech yesterday, Boris Johnson spoke about um, needing regulation in life sciences. There's a real shift towards understanding that if we can regulate, we can actually innovate more. And that there's a real opportunity here to be, uh, the UK could be the place that carefully and cleverly regulates things like artificial intelligence to make it better. 
No, good. And there's a very interesting school of thought that says actually imagination loves boundaries and actually we could unleash a lot more in that. Um, Tabitha, some questions coming in from viewers and uh, I'm going to ask you to be quite sort of quick fire just so we get as many in as possible. Uh, here's a question from Tim Hart. With the advances of AI, will we all ultimately be made redundant? That's probably Tim from his sofa. Who knows? Uh, mm -hmm. But no. what do you think? The answer is no. Um, the answer is no, not all. The answer is that tasks will be taken by artificial intelligence, but not whole jobs. Um, so that is the technical answer. Now, whether a company or another company decides to um, make people redundant, that's really down to the business decisions. And I think we have to be really conscious that AI doesn't make people redundant people do and businesses do and really what AI should be doing is enabling people to do more with their time and be more efficient more effective and so on yeah excellent thank you and thank you for keeping that uh, suitably pithy I know we could talk for a long time about this next question um, it's about ethics um, how do you allow the development of AI to proceed ethically what are the user uses quotes here ethics you consider for artificial intelligence Oh my gosh, pithy. Um, a pithy <laughs> answer is almost impossible for a question like that. So I would suggest that the, the people, the person asking the question, anyone else who's interested, has a look at two places. So one is the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, which is a government organization, and the other is the Ada Lovelace Foundation. They are really at the forefront of working through what ethics means in this case. Um, and it's really too nuanced for me to give my opinion here, but it's about safety, robustness, translation, ex ex accessibility, uh, transparency. You know, there's a whole suite of things that make up AI ethics. I mean, could I ask a sort of related question, which is more about the order in which we do things? I mean, in the old days, you know, a board would meet and go off and tell the tech team what was to be done. And I just wonder whether in the old way of doing things, you know, we trooped off to the ethics committee to sign something off. And I wonder to what extent you're confident that those ethicists, if you like, and can we all be ethicists in that sense, are around the top table right at the origin of the next wave of products and services? such a good point and it's such a quick fix in order to limit the risk of things hitting the consumer um, far too late. So I think that a good idea comes from anywhere and we've seen now that good ideas come from tech teams and now we need to make sure that good ideas are come from, coming from ethicists too. We need people who understand the user and people who are ethically trained in every single step of the yeah. process. Yeah. Every single step. Yeah, no, it's usually important. Right, another question comes in from Peter Sykes. Should a conversation with robots or a robot always be announced? And I think that what Peter's hinting at there is that gist that that bot is pretending to be a human but isn't really. What do you think? Yes, 100%. I think that's a really good and simple example of where we could have regulation so or standards. Um, I think that Toby Walsh in Australia is one of my favorite academics on this. He talks about how in the old days when you had cars, you'd have someone who would walk in front of the car with a flag to tell people that the car was coming. Um, and I think we need a similar thing with artificial intelligence. We should never interact with an AI without knowing it is an AI. Interesting, very interesting indeed. Uh, Mark Stevenson, ah, the reluctant futurists himself asks, uh, what is the interface of law and order and AI? Can we police the moral decisions made by embedded or by or slash embedded in technology? God, we're making you work hard this morning, Tabitha. <laughs> Yes, I hope so. It's definitely a challenge, whichever working group on that specifically, which you could join um, with the, in the AI Council. Um, the police force are really stretching their own understandings of this and working with experts. It's going to take some time. It's definitely one of the more sticky areas to, to, to address, but without a doubt, it should be something that we're, that we're using. I just... Uh, this morning by accident clicked on a, one of those spam text messages gave them all my details because they said that they'd they'd missed i'd missed a parcel and of course i was like oh no i missed a parcel i was in a frantic and i and i did it and this is a really good example where um ai could have averted you know could have given me yes. enough information to avert something like that I mean, it's reassuring that it even happens to you tabitha so <laughs> final very quick question if computers thank you alex daly for sending this in if computers lack common sense what are the main areas computers can't help there's a question 
Shafi got it right earlier, caring, <laughs> you know, loving, being empathetic. All of the things that make us human is what they will never be able to do.